There you go. It's a good thing I can talk loud. Uh, also, we have on the back table where the bulletins were, little, you're invited to Good Friday and Easter services cards. And they tell us the, when things are happening and all that sort of stuff. It also has our YouTube channel that people can tune into. So there's plenty of cards out back there. Grab a bunch. It's a perfect time to invite people because this is a time when people start thinking about spiritual things. So invite people. Come, let them know there's free food Easter morning. They can come, eat a lot of food, and then sleep through the service. It's okay. So grab some cards. If we need to print off more, we'll print off more. So a couple words about this sermon. I didn't have a lot of time to put this sermon together. Uh, and most of that, it was like, so the PowerPoint that's going to have is going to be very basic. Can, I talk, can we talk about this week a little bit? You okay with that? Let's talk about this week. So Friday, was, Monday was a pretty much normal day. And I got most of the research for this sermon done. And then Tuesday, I had a group of pastors here. And I had four pastors crying downstairs. We spent most of the day talking about everything that was going on in their churches and the hurts they were doing. That was Tuesday. Wednesday I took, was my family day. Because Friday is normally my family day, but I was going to be gone with the teens, so Wednesday was my family day. Thursday, we did some homeschool stuff, then at a board meeting, which took all, I mean, pff, Brooke talks a lot. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> and then Friday, I jumped in the car and went down to Kearney with four crazy teenagers and Karen. Oh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> You can take that however you want to, Karen. <laughs> and so in between going to sessions of the Stint Discipleship Weekend with the youth, I worked on actually preparing the sermon and putting the PowerPoint together in between everything. And I would sit down at a table, no one was there, and I'd be working, and all of a sudden these other people who I hadn't seen for 10 years would come up like, Peter! And we knew each other down in Dallas. And so we'd catch up, and then I'd start where it's been crazy crazy week. So this, this PowerPoint isn't all the snazzy it could be, and you know, my thoughts are a little disjointed. But here, here are some pictures of our week. So we arrived, and we're met by this guy. You can't really see it, but he's got a mohawk. And I walked in, and I was like, what in the world am I getting myself into? And I think some of the teens were that way too. What in the world are we getting ourselves into? He did a great job, good music. He was there with his buddy. He sang and played the guitar, and his buddy played the drums and the keyboard, and synthesizer, and something else. Like, he was the musician, and this guy was just up there. But they, they did a great job. They did a great job leading us in worship. We, heard, we listened to a lot of good sessions about uh, Christianity. Why are we a Christian? And if you talk to Georgia, or Bastion, or Percy, and you ask them, why are you a Christian? Hopefully, they'll give a different answer than what we normally give to why are we a Christian. And hopefully it's the right one. So there you go. Um, that evening, Friday night, we stayed at a youth center in Kearney that's owned by my friend Shannon, or owned by a buddy of my friend Shannon Arduzer. The boys stayed in this game room. Does the floor look comfortable? <laughs> and the gals stayed upstairs where there was carpet and beds and all that sort of stuff. Some of the girls, they weren't enough beds, so they stayed on the floor, but hey, they had carpet. We stayed on this. I brought an air mattress, but I forgot my pillow. <laughs> the, <laughs> so the shindig, that night there was a concert. So the concert didn't end till after 10.30. We didn't get back to this place till after 11. And the boys didn't get to sleep, or at least didn't turn the lights off till after 10.30. Tw sorry, 12.30. And we told them, hey, breakfast is at 7.15, so I had to get up before that in order to help with breakfast. And I, we didn't get much sleep. <laughs> Which is why the next day you have pictures like this. <laughs> and like this. <laughs> we had a great time. We learned a lot, a lot of stuff. Even though they were tired, they still soaked up some stuff. We, we talked about it afterwards, and they all came away with some really good things from the speakers, that, from other 
from East Coast and West Coast that came and talked about apologetics and what it means to, uh, to share our faith, what are the facts behind it. It was really good. So that's the group that went, and we had a great fun time. So talk with Percy, talk with Georgia, talk with Bastion. I won't call them out. Oh my God, there were over 800 people. Thank you. There were over 800 people there. Uh, including ten, teens and youth leaders. So it was a great time, and I look forward to going back again next year. It'll probably take me a whole other year to recuperate. <laughs> so I'm kind of tired. <laughs> I have no idea what's going to come out of my mouth. I have what I've said, supposed to say written down, but when I get tired, things just come out of my mouth. So be prepared. I'm going to try to stay with this, all right? One thing I didn't say during announcements, praise time, uh, is that I have officially completed all of the requirements for my Doctor of Ministry degree. Thank you. I did my exit interview, my defense last, well, that's another thing that happened Monday, so I forgot. I did my defense for my dissertation on Monday. So it's been, it's been a week, but I had a great time. So uh, I'm walking down in Dallas on May 11th. That's a Saturday. It's my wedding anniversary, so my anniversary present to my wife is I won't be in school anymore. <laughs> the graduation ceremony will be live streamed. If anyone wants to watch it, they can. No obligation, uh, but it will be live streamed from the Dallas's website. So, yeah, that exit interview is interesting. It was conducted over Zoom. I hate Zoom meetings. I really do. I'd rather meet face-to-face -face with people, hands down. But it was conducted over Zoom. Now, to do a web-based video call, there are certain things you must have. Yes? You must have internet access. Yes? Yeah. Everyone agreed with that? All right, good. To have internet access, you must have Internet. Yes? Okay. To have internet, you have to have electricity. Yes. We're good with this? Yes. All right. I had all those things. Got on the phone call, Zoom call, was talking with my primary reader for my dissertation, was talking with the head of the doctoral department of Dallas, explaining everything that was going on, what I learned, why my dissertation is the best thing since sliced cheese. And my primary reader had asked me a really profound question and I was waxing eloquent in my response, when all of a sudden, his video feed just froze. <laughs> and then it, poof, gone. And I looked at the head of the doctoral program at Dallas and said, I have no, no idea what's going on. He said, I have no idea what's going on. And we said, well, maybe something happened with his internet. I went online to check the weather, to see what the weather, because his, this guy lives over in Illinois, see what the weather's like over there. Clear skies, 0% chance of precipitation. I have no idea. Finally, got a phone call with him. He had lost his electricity. No idea why, randomly, no electricity. And so we stopped Zoom, we went to a phone call, finished it up, and it was, it was, it was a really weird talk really weird talk. But it was good. Our life is controlled by electricity. Like, if you have an electric stove and you want cookies, do you know what you need to have cookies? Electricity. It's horrible. And pretty much in anything in this life, if you want something, you have to be plugged into some sort of power source. You do not just in our physical life, but also in our spiritual life. If we claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, and we say we want to live the Christian life as God has called us to live, we have to be, we must be plugged into some sort of power source because we cannot do it on our own. That's something we've mentioned over and over and over again for the past three months. Where have we been? We started off beginning of January and said that none of us are able to live the life as we've been called to live on our own. We are all powerless in our sins and our addictions, and there's nothing we can do to change that state. 
We talked about how we must believe that God alone has the power to change our hearts and our lives. Not only must we believe intellectually the truth, but we all must make the decision to say, yes, I trust Jesus as my Savior. I place all my hope for this life and the next on Jesus, draw the line of the stand, step it across it and say, you are my only hope. There must be that point. We talked about how as we live this Christian life, we're now saved and we're seeking to follow Jesus. We have to daily make this moral inventory of ourselves to stare in the mirror and say, yes, this is who I am. I am a sinner in need of a savior. And this is the sins that I'm drawn to. This is why I'm drawn. This is the path that I take to them. These are the triggers that put me on the path. We make this inventory of ourselves so that we can turn and confess to ourselves, God, and a trusted friend, that this is who I am, this is what I struggle with, I need help. And then they help us to repent, to turn from that sin 180 degrees and turn towards God, and we start following him. We start walking and saying, lead me, God, in the way you want me to go, and he teaches us how to love him and love each other. And as he does that, he shows us all these fractured, fractured relationships in our life, that we need these relationships in order to follow him effectively. And so he teaches us and gives us the strength to be people who forgive and people who make amends. And he shows us how we must continue on that path every single day. I walked, got into my car on Friday. Like I said, I had four crazy teenagers and Karen. And I brought out my phone and I put it on my little clip there with the GPS on it. And I heard a voice behind me saying, recalculating. If you weren't there for the sermon last week, go back, you'll catch the joke. All right. For us to be able to do any of these things, to live the Christian life that God has called us to live, pursuing the love of God and love of others and throwing all these idols of our addictions and sin aside, for us to be able to do that, we must be people who seek intimacy. We must seek intimacy. We are people who seek to deepen our relationship with God daily and depend on his power to do his will. We cannot live the Christian life effectively if we are not depending upon the power of God in our lives. This dependence only happens through a deepening relationship with God. Our text is John 17, verses 1 to 3. We'll be specifically focusing on verse 3. Jesus is in the upper room. It's the night that he's going to be betrayed. He's spent a whole bunch of time teaching the disciples. He washed their feet. He then taught them about eternity, taught them about Holy Spirit, taught them about how to love each other. And then he stops his lecture and he starts praying to God. And he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you've given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you that you are the God who called us, and you sent a way for us to have eternal life through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you not only that, that we are saved and forgiven, but we're given a relationship with you. We're given an ability to have intimacy with the creator of the universe. And that blows my mind. Father, you know I need help this morning as I seek to speak effectively and to point people to you. And I ask you'd give me that help because I need it. Father, as I'm here, I ask that I would decrease and that you would increase. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Thanks, Father. Amen. Let's talk about eternal life. Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life. Love that concept. It's ironic that our first speaker at the Stint Discipleship Weekend on Friday talked about this verse. Uh, in the first session, and I already planned this sermon, I already done a lot of research, and he pulls off this verse, so I was like, ha, that's cool. So if you were there, don't worry, I'm not going to steal too much from him. And if you weren't there, eh, you won't know what I stole or not. It's great. <laughs> What's the big deal about eternal life? Isn't, I, I talk to lots of people, especially in the school system, the teens these days, I talk to them about life, and they say, well, this life is all there is. 
Isn't this life the best? If there's anything in the future, I'm not going to live for that because I don't even know if such thing as eternity exists. I'm going to live for today. Majority of the teens in Neely, that's what the talks I have with them. Why look forward to something that's probably not going to be there? Well, the thing is, every single person who has ever breathed, whether they realize it or not, were made for eternity. And one day, death's going to come knocking at the door. Even if we try to hide in this life what we know deep down inside, when death comes knocking at the door, we're going to remember again that there is a great unknown out there. There is something beyond the doors of death. We might fill our lives in this world with all sorts of idols in the forms of addictions, whether it's alcohol or drug abuse or pornography or control or codependency or people pleasing, whatever the idol is that's in our life, we fill our lives with these things to convince ourselves that we can find what we want here and now. But then death comes knocking and reminds us that all that we filled our lives with is worthless because it does not affect what's beyond. I was at the bedside of a dying person this past fall. They had seen my name in the newspaper and called me up out of the blue. And so I went there and I sat with them and talked with them. And the person there lying on the bed knew she only had a couple hours left and she was scared stiff. And her sister who was sitting next to me was even more scared because they knew something was going to happen, but they had no idea what that looked like. What do you do? You try to tell the truth, but it's up to them to see whether they're going to believe that truth or not. At the beginning of this season of these talks, I talked about how we were made for eternal life, and that life is only found through the creator of the universe. He is the one who created us. He is the one who gives us that life. Unfortunately, our sin separates us from him. The sins that we willingly commit every single day. So because of that, since we're separated from the giver of life, we are doomed for an eternity of death. And we don't want that. Even if we try to force ourselves to believe that there's no such thing of eternity, deep down inside, we know it's true. And whether we believe God or not, deep down inside, we don't want eternal death. There is a fear there. There is a horror. Blaise Pascal said, everyone has a God-shaped hole in their life. And they try to fill that hole with all sorts of other things. But it doesn't fill it. It doesn't cut it. This life that we're living is not eternal life. Eternal life is to come. Our addictions that we're trying to fill our life with are not God. That God is standing out there holding his hand saying, will you come to me? There's only one thing that can fill the hole in our life of eternity. Only one thing that will provide what we yearn for. So what is that prescription for life? If we yearn for eternity, what will give it to us? Jesus said in John 17, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. The only way to eternal life is to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom God has sent. It clearly says that. But let's take a pause, shall we? How does Jesus, when he is praying to the Father, describe his Father? He describes him as the only true God. Let's unpack that. He is the true God. This is not a subjective statement true. It's not. I could stand up here and say that ice cream is the best dessert in the whole wide world. I could say that. And how many of you would agree that that is true? You can be bold. Thank you for those bold people to agree with me. My sister's like, eh. She only says that because I said it. I'm saying a statement that I believe is true. But that's subjective, because other people have a favorite dessert. 
and that they believe is true. Those are all subjective. When Jesus says, this is the only true God, he is not saying, yeah, God's my favorite dessert. It's not a subjective statement. It is an objective statement. It is a truth. It is something that is reality despite people's opinions or preconceived notions. No matter what anyone believes about God, he is the true God. He's the creator of the universe. He's the one who holds all things together. He is the one who has a righteous standard that he demands that everyone toes and meets. And this statement that God is the true God can be proven over and over and over again because it is a truth that is based on reality and not on perception. God is the true God, which means that there are false gods out there. Jesus says that God is the only true God. There are many religions in this world, all of which tout a God or multiple gods, but they are not the true God. You can crack open any of their sacred texts, and I enjoy collecting them. I've got a bunch in my office. And you can read their descriptions of their so-called gods, and we would see that their God is not our God. I've talked with several people over the last couple of months who've come up to me and said, you know, I just found out that the Muslims and the Christians worship the same God. And I look at them and say, have you read the Quran? And they haven't. And I said, if you did, you would see that their God is not our God. They're described completely differently. We're actually going to be starting a study here at church for our adult Sunday school class. Once gospel-shaped outreach is done, we're going to be starting a study on world religions and cults, which I'm really looking forward to. I didn't get a chance, but starting next week, I'm going to have a bowl in the back and you can, with some note cards, and you can write down any religion or cult that you want to learn about. And I'll make sure that during our study, we will cover them. Some ones will take one Sunday to cover. Some we might take several Sundays to cover. But we'll make sure that we learn. It's important to know how we are different from the other religions. That we're not a copycat religion, but we, are, we hold the truth. And that's why we believe this. Because it is the truth. Jesus said, this is eternal life. Yeah. That you know, they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ you've been sent. God, the true God, is the only one through whom we can have eternal life. And God sent Jesus that we might know him through the blood of the Lamb. If you want it more blatant, Jesus says earlier in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God is the only true God, and there's only way and way to eternal life, and that is through Jesus, whom God has sent. He died on the cross 2,000 years ago, taking our sins on his shoulders, raising from the grave as we're going to celebrate in a few weeks, proving that his salvation is real, and he offers it as a free gift to anyone who would take it. Romans chapter 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. My question is, have you received that gift? It's of utmost importance. If you've never received the gift of Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. Make the decision to turn from your sins, your religions, your idols, and place your faith in Jesus alone. There's no eternity, no eternal life apart from him. Let's talk about the word no, shall we? Jesus said this is eternal life, that they might know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is found in knowing God. Do you know what it means to know? When someone's dating someone, they're getting to know them. Hopefully, they're creating a database of everything that that person is like through all different situations, through all different seasons, how they act around their family, how they act around their friends, how they act around the person that they are interested in, all these sorts of things. They're figuring out, hey, what does this person believe? 
Do they believe the same way as I do? Do they worship the same God? Do they believe salvation is through Christ alone, by faith through grace? Is, 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 are we on the same page? Because God says, don't be unequally yoked, and all those sorts of stuff. Are we going the same direction with God as the focal point? Are we going like this, and I'm following God, and they're not? We, there's this database of all these facts about a person. They're finding things intellectually about the person. They're experiencing things, but it's all up here, hopefully. It's all up here. They're not actually intimately knowing someone. It's all intellectual stuff. The word that Jesus has used here is not that word for no, for compiling a database of facts about something. You see, after dating comes marriage. And after marriage comes a baby in a baby carriage. <laughs> the word that this is used for, biblically, this no, is for when a husband and wife come together and consummate their marriage. A husband and wife know each other intimately, experientially, everything united, nothing hidden, no shame complete oneness. You see, there's a knowing intellectually, and there's a knowing experientially and intimately. If you study different languages, a lot of them aren't lazy like English. English, we say the word know, I know this. It can mean the spectral of things. Study other languages, they actually have different words for these. So here's your random fact for the day. In German, to know intellectually is kennen. To know experientially is Vision. There you go. That's your random facts. Eternal life is knowing God. We were created not just to have a list of facts in our brain. We were created to have a relationship and intimacy with the creator of the universe. And as I said before, this relationship was broken because of our sin, because of our choices. And Jesus, 2,000 years ago, died, yes, to earn forgiveness, yes, to earn justification, but he died to restore that relationship that was broken, that we might know God again, or a better translation if we bring in our English idioms would be that we might have a relationship with God again, that we might intimately know God even as we are known by him. There are many people who make the decision to accept Jesus Christ as their savior. They trust him. They turn from their sins. They turn from their gods. They say, Jesus, you're my only hope. I believe in you for my salvation. I trust you. And they think they're good. And yes, they're saved. They are because salvation is through grace by Christ alone. It's his gift, nothing we earn. But their life is so shallow. They still feel a lack in their life. There's no victory over sins. There's no joy. There's no purpose. Why? Because they're missing a piece. We were created to have a relationship with our Savior. We were saved in order to have a relationship with our Creator. That's why Jesus died. So it's one thing to say, yes, I believe in Jesus for my salvation, and it's another thing to say, I'm gonna pursue a relationship with him because he died that I might have it. These people accept Christ. And they sometimes come to church because that's what you do, that's what you're supposed to do. So they sometimes come, maybe, I guess. Maybe they listen to Christian radio sometimes turn on because they feel obligated to do it now and then. Maybe listen to some Christian comedians because it's just trash over there because, yeah, I guess I'll do it, you know. But they're not pursuing a relationship with God. They're not seeking to know him intimately, even as he knows us. There are many Christians who have been Christians for years, over 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, but they've never pursued a relationship with God, and Paul would describe them as infants because they're saved but they don't know him, and it saddens me. They've never known the sweetness of fellowship with someone who loves them so much. There are many people think that, you know, what separates us from the animals? And they say it's because we can think. We have an intellect, we can reason. Yeah, that's true, but that's not the main thing. 
We weren't created to think. We were created to love. God created us that we might love him and worship him. And out of love and worship him, of loving and worshiping him, we then think and we then create and we do this all because of our worship of him. And if our life doesn't have that worship, that intimacy, it is empty. I think about the psalmist, Psalm 63 verse one, you God are my God, earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. And as in a dry and parched land where there's no water. Psalm 135. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. In his word, I put my hope. Isaiah says in Isaiah 26, 9, my soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. Your, when your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the Lord will learn righteousness. I, I yearn for you, God. Whether I'm going down to bed at night or right when I wake up, there's a longing to spend time with you. When was the last time that you yearned to spend time with God? When was the last time? Heaven help us. In the morning, I love the song. In the morning when I rise. In the morning when I rise. In the morning when I rise. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all the world. Give me Jesus. Is that your cry? And you know the amazing truth? Once we begin to actually pursue a relationship with our Savior Jesus Christ, seeking an intimacy with Him, we're going to stop turning from all these idols and sins and addictions in our life. It's like being married. Once we finally commit to pursue one woman, and we're overjoyed in the relationship with her, or if you're a gal, you're pursuing one guy, and you're overjoyed in the commitment to that one guy, and it's all we want for. And temptations come up, and desires of lust and all these things, and we stop and we say, wait a minute, no, I love her. I love him. He's all I want, nothing else. When we pursue an intimacy with Jesus, these idols, these addictions, they stop becoming desirable for us because we've found the real thing. We've found what our heart desires, what we yearn for, the thing that will fill that hole. And as we seek him and we lean with dependence on him and we find our intimacy in him, we then found the power to turn from all these false gods that are screaming at us and we say, no, I've got the real thing. He is my longing. I know him. I know him. What does this look like to pursue a relationship with Jesus Christ? It means we take our life and we rip it apart. We turn it head over head and reshape all of our priorities. Because left to ourselves, we're going to pursue all these other gods because we think they're real. And we place them as our priorities instead of the one true God. Back in the day, this process of tearing apart our life and completely reshaping it was called pursuing spiritual disciplines. If you want more information on what I'm about to share, I have some resources you can borrow. I just ask you to give them back. But I got resources. Do you know why back in the day people called these things they going to talk about spiritual disciplines? Because they're hard. And we don't want to do them. They take discipline to say, yes, I am going to do this. We and of ourselves do not naturally prioritize a relationship with our Savior. So we have to discipline ourselves to do it. There's sometimes we don't want to do it, and so we force ourselves to do it. But the more we do it, the more we want to do it because we taste that sweetness. This concept, they get the term spiritual discipline from 1 Corinthians 9, 26 to 27. Paul says, therefore, I don't run like someone running aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. He disciplines his body. He bits it and says, this is the life I'm going to leave. Even when I don't want to do it, I am going to do it. 
It's like going to the gym, working out. I don't go to the gym, full disclosure. But I do exercise every morning, so, so I don't think I'm being a hypocrite. There are lots of times you don't want to do it, but you know you should. And so you get up and you do it. And once you do it, it feels good. Your body feels awake. It's like you're going out and you really don't want to work cattle or fix the fence, but then you do it and you feel better like I have accomplished it. I have done what I'm supposed to do. And then if you do it enough and you catch that glimmer enough, you start wanting to do it more and more because you see the prize at the end. So what are these spiritual disciplines? Lots of writers split spiritual disciplines into disciplines of letting go, like Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.11, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. So spiritual disciplines that help you let go of these things. And then there's a category of activity, things that nurture our soul and strengthen us for the race ahead, as Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 9. I'm not going to talk about spiritual disciplines in those categories because I felt like being a maverick. I'm going to talk about daily disciplines and seasonal disciplines. Daily disciplines. Now, I'm about to say some things that I know some people will want to come up to me and say, Peter, I don't have enough time to do that. Don't you know my life? Don't you know everything I have going on? Don't you know my day? And yes, I do. We'll get that all out. I know your day. You say, no, you don't. Well, I'll, well, I'll have you describe it to me, and I'll look at you and square in the eyes and say, yes, I know your day. I know what you're going through. I'm busy too. And then you'll say, but you're a pastor. I'm like, okay, fair enough. I have a little more flexibility over my life. Yes, but I know people who have days like yours who are not a pastor who do these things. My question for you, if you say, I don't have enough time in my day, I will look at you and I will say, do you have time to go to the bathroom? I will say, do you have time to drink water and eat food? All right, thank you. Appreciate the vocalism. <laughs> there are some days you might be busy, and you push off those three activities. And you say, yeah, i got to go to the bathroom, but i got to get this done first. And so you wait. And there's some days you say, I'm thirsty, but i got to get this done first. And you wait. And there's some days you say, I'm hungry, but i got to get this done first. And so you wait. But by the end of the day, I can guarantee that you will go to the bathroom, you will drink water, and you'll eat something. Because what happens if you don't? I heard a, oops. <laughs> we, we know those things are important, and we will become physically uncomfortable if we don't. And sometimes we might have to go to the hospital if we wait too long. Spiritual disciplines are important. Seeking intimacy with God is of vital importance and if we do not do it daily, we will become spiritually uncomfortable. Unfortunately, too many of us have been pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off, and we've become spiritually constipated, and we've become spiritually anorexic. And it's a shame. And we've done it so long that we look at our body and we look at our symptoms spiritually and we say, but isn't this normal? What's wrong with it? And we look at the symptoms in our life and we wonder why this, this, and this is happening. And we don't realize that it's because we're not spending time with our creator. We're not seeking intimacy with him. We wonder why we keep going back to the same sin over and over and over again. It's because we're not plugging into the source. It's important these daily disciplines of spending time with God. What are they? Well, study. What we filled our minds with defines what we think. What we think defines our actions. Intimacy with God comes as we study the word of God and we get to know him better through his word. This weekend has been crazy, as I said. I talked to you about the schedule, how I was forced to stay up really, really late Friday. And then I was forced to wake up really, really early Saturday, and I, my alarm went off, and I had a choice. Was I going to wake up and take a, 
do all my stuff in the bathroom and all that sort of stuff, make sure I looked presentable and not like a wild beast. And was I going to take enough time? My sister smirks at me. He's like, you always look like a wild beast. <laughs> and was I going to take the time to spend time with God that morning? I was really tired. I hit snooze. And then right as my finger got off of it, I was like, wait a minute. Today's an important day. Uh, there's some conversations I want to have with some people today, spiritually. There's things I know God's going to do in the hearts of people. I need to seek him, that he would do those things. That he would break some people's hearts that I needed, no needed broken. And so I took that time. I hated every minute of it. Honesty. But it was important. It refocused my mind. And I got to seek God, grabbing just that few moments to get the strength that comes from intimacy, which brings us to the next spiritual discipline, which is prayer. Spending time studying his word, yet, but, yes, but praying. And I'm not just talking about praying before a meal or as the Jews do it after the meal. I'm not talking about praying with the kids before bed. Those are all great, bringing those rhythms of prayer into our life, teaching those rhythms to our kids. But we need specific times to pray to God every single day about our hurts, our needs, our desires, because we were made to have a relationship with him. We come we, every single day. We need to guard that time to talk to him. But we shouldn't just be bringing our hurts and our needs and our desires to God and all those sorts of things, but we should also be spending time exalting him and worshiping him daily. Come, worship it happens in church, yes, and we all should be coming to church. That's another part of the spiritual discipline, coming to church every week, because there's some Sundays we don't want to come. We wake up and we want to sleep in. There's other things we want to do, but coming to God saying, yes, this is something, not because I want to, but because I need to seek intimacy with him. So we come to church as often as we can, but we also have moments every day that we set aside, not just to bring our requests to the divine venging machine, but to worship God for who he is and think about it. But unfortunately, when we do that, it reminds us of who we are. So in our time of praying, as we worship, we also have a time of confession. That's tricky, because as we confess to God, he's going to spur on some things that we need to confess to someone else, a trusted friend, because we need the strength, or we need to make amends and confess how we hurt someone else, and that's going to be hard, and we don't want to do it. But that's why it's a spiritual discipline, because the process of confession, of saying, of reminding ourselves, this is who I am, actually creates intimacy with God because we're worshiping and we're claiming the truth of what he says. But yes, this is who I am, and I need you. I preached a whole sermon on that. I'm not going to talk about it. The last discipline that I'm going to talk about with daily disciplines is silence. There are a lot of other daily disciplines we can do, but silence is very important. We live in a world of noise. It's amazing. I'm going to make some people self-conscious. I'm sorry. It's amazing how many houses I walk into and the TV is going. Not because they're actually watching it, but it just is going all the time because there needs to be something there. It, it's, we go into cars, and we turn the ignition key on, and immediately the radio starts playing because that's how we left it, because we have a, something going on all the time as we're driving. I sub in the school, and I tell them, hey, you can work on this project. And they're like, great. And they start working on the project. And the first thing they do is they put earphones in their ears so they can listen to music as they work on the project. We fill our minds with so much stuff, and we need to shut it off. Because as we fill our minds with stuff, we forget our God. Sometime during the day, we need to shut everything off and be still before our holy God. Psalm 46, 10 says, he says, be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. We all have to have time when we shut everything off and we're still before God and reflect on what we've read, we reflect on what we know about him. But unfortunately, many of us, if we say we're too busy to read the Bible, we say we're too busy to pray, we're gonna say we're too busy to be silent and be still before God and reflect what we know about him. Okay, 
in the next two minutes, I need to squish the rest of these in. Seasonal disciplines. Not only are there daily disciplines, but there are seasonal disciplines. And these are sometimes harder for people to do because even though they only happen once or twice a year, they take a much longer amount of time to do. Fellowship is a spiritual discipline. We say, hey, I'm going to disrupt my ordinary life to spend time with the people of God so that I can know God better, so I can build my intimacy with him. We spend time with his family so that we can know him, just like when you're dating, you spend time with the family so you can know the dude. Our monthly fellowship meals are actually a spiritual discipline. Eating food is fine. We all enjoy eating food, but holding conversations with someone about something that is deep in their lives or mine can be hard, but is a way of pursuing intimacy. Not just our fellowship meals, but other fellowship times where we say, I'm going to stop my life, I'm going to die to what is natural, normal for me, and I'm going to invest in the life of an individual. Not only should we spend time with the people of God, but we should spend time alone, away from the people of God. Two opposite extremes. Every year, I take a few days and I go off to a camp and I spend time, and I pray over the past year, I pray over the f- next year, I plan, well, God, what are you calling me, what are you calling the church to do, and I make plans based on that for the next for, you know, couple of days for the next over the week. Once a year, I also send Maggie out for a few days, because not only do I need solitude, but she does too, and she does the same thing. And we have stipulations wherever we go that we're not going to interact with people, We might say hi to someone. Of course, there's the registration as we go to the camp or the retreat center, but the rest of the time, we're not going to hold conversations with other people because people, lots of times, will distract us from the business we have to do with God. Jesus regularly left the crowds, left his disciples, and went up on the mountain to spend time with God because we need that time, just him and us, routinely. Lastly, fasting. There's a lot more spiritual disciplines, things that we do to grow close to God, but the fasting is the last one. Fasting is the process by which we say no to something in order to focus on God. Traditionally, food has been the means of fasting, and yes, it is an important means. The Jews, actually, in Jesus' day, would take one day every week, and this was the day they would fast. They would fast one meal that day. Every week, it happened. Christians of the early church picked a different day because they didn't want to be like those Jews. Christians would pass this day every week, one meal. If you were a Christian, you knew this this was not the meal you would go and ask someone to go out to eat with you because no one would be eating it if you were a Christian. During that time, instead of eating, they would spend time with God. They wouldn't fill their life with all sorts of other stuff. They would say, instead of eating, I'm going to have a special time with God right now. It would remind them that God is the one who provides, remind them that he is the only one that they need. Intermittent fasting, which is the rage nowadays, it's possibly worthwhile, is not considered true fasting. I talked with one person that said, oh, I fast all the time. I intermittent fast. I don't know anyone who intermittent fasts that take that time that they would have been eating and uses it to spend with God. That's the key to fasting. You remove something, and in place of that thing, you place time with God. Today, we can fast in all sorts of ways. Food is a great thing because we all like food and it just hits us in the face. People should probably routinely fast from technology nowadays to say, hey, I know some families that once, one day every week, they do not pick up their phones or their computers or their tablets. They don't turn on the TV for a whole day and that is their day to fast from technology. There's all sorts of things we can fast from, desserts, vehicles, I don't know. But the important thing is that during the fast, when we feel the desire to go to social media, when we feel the desire to eat ice cream, we use that as a cue every time we feel that desire to turn to God instead. We were created to have intimacy with God. That's when we feel whole. That's when we feel worth. That is only through that intimacy that we have the strength to live the life that God has called us to live. And so we seek to deepen our relationship with God daily and depend on his power to do as well. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for your love for us and your desire to know us and your desire to have us know you. Teach us how to do that effectively and to turn to you daily and seasonally because you, Lord, are worth everything. Amen.
Take our hymnals and stand and turn to number 189. 189, Calvary covers it all. Colossians 2.18. 